Okay, maybe we can uh, make a start uh, since uh, almost everybody is here. We've now covered almost everything on this chart except for perlite. Okay, and today's lecture will finish off on all the transformations and then move on to applications again. So I'm going to talk about perlite and this is the only transformation in which we get two phases growing together from the austenite. So they cooperate in growing from the austenite at a common transformation front. You've got cementite and ferrite growing together with a common transformation front. Okay. Okay, so um, perlite is a reconstructive transformation. Uh, that means uh, there must be diffusion, sufficient diffusion and atomic mobility for it to occur at all. It does not happen at low temperatures, and also there is no surface relief due to the phase transformation. So if you polish a sample of austenite completely flat and you transform it to austenite, you don't see a change in the topology of the surface, apart from volume change effects. Okay. So it's much closer to equilibrium than any of the displacive transformations that we've discussed. And here is the structure. These are colonies of perlite in a partially transformed specimen. This is austenite and these are colonies of perlite. You can see that clearly there is a lot of structure inside the colonies because it etches gray and you may or may not be able to resolve the interlamella, uh, the lamella structure depending on the spacing. So here for example the spacing is very very small. It's of the order of 50 nanometers. So you would not resolve this in an optical microscope. It would just appear gray like this. But if the spacing is coarse, then on certain sections, you may be able to see the lamellae of cementite, ferrite, cementite, ferrite. And I explained to you in a previous lecture that a colony of perlite is not really uh, one layer of cementite, another layer of ferrite, and so on, but an interpenetrating bicrystal ferrite and cementite. Okay? So there are only two crystals in here in terms of crystallographic orientation, ferrite and cementite. And what we see when we look at images like these are sections of, uh, of that uh, three-dimensional structure. So it appears as if we have alternating layers of ferrite and cementite. Now, perlite is an extremely important uh, mixture of phases, and it happens in the vast majority of the 1.3 billion tons of steel that's produced every year. Okay, so it's a very important phase, uh, phase mixture, just like allotromorphic ferrite, which is the majority phase in most structural steels. So I'm going to begin by showing you some examples of where perlite is used. Um, this is what perlite often looks like in a steel. When you section, you see bands like this. Okay? So the dark regions are the perlite and the light regions are the ferrite. Why is that? Why are we seeing it as a banded structure? Yeah? Ro hot rolling, yeah? But uh, why does hot rolling, you're right, hot rolling will spread things out, but why does it give you bands. Yeah. Any idea? Why, why is perlite forming in these regions and less perlite in these regions? Have you heard of bending? B and D I N G. So you know when you get chemical segregation during casting, yeah, interdendritic segregation, when you roll that, that spreads out. So you get regions of the steel which are rich in manganese and poor in manganese. So when the material cools from austenite, the regions which are poor in manganese, which are here, transform to allotriomorphic ferrite. That partitions carbon into the manganese-rich regions and then that transforms into a perlite-rich band. Okay? So this really is a manifestation of the segregation of manganese 
during solidification. And if you either cool rapidly or you process this differently, then you can get rid of this bending. Because if you cool rapidly, then ferrite will nucleate in all regions because there's enough driving force and therefore you get more uniform structure. So when we make uh, pipelines for uh, you know, difficult environments where there's hydrogen induced cracking and sulfide induced cracking and so on, you really don't want these bands of perlite. So they are accelerated cooled in order to reduce the amount of carbon segregation that happens because of the manganese segregation. Okay. And modern steels, which are microalloyed and processed differently, will show much less of the bending that we observe. Okay. Okay. Have you ever seen this before? So, you know, we had the Olympic Games in Britain just very 2012 and that's me I went to the Olympic Games this is an object which was created by ArcelorMittal to celebrate the Olympics and it cost approximately 20 million pounds to construct and it has about 2600 tons of steel and it's still there you can go and see it uh, the Olympic Park still exists so all this is structural steel. Yeah, you can see these are pictures that I took. And basically, almost all structural steel will consist of mixtures of ferrite and perlite. And the strength levels might be as low as, uh, you know, 250 megapascals and going up to something like 500 megapascals, but you don't go much beyond that because welding becomes an issue. Okay, so the vast majority of structural steels are not really that strong when you compare with you know, what you're trying to do with trip steels and automotive steels and so on. The strength levels are quite small. 400 megapascals is quite typical for structural steels. I don't actually know exactly what kind of steel this is, but whenever there's a large scale application, you'll be looking at materials with strengths of the order of 400 megapascals. Okay, now this uh, is a, one of my first ever PhD students. His name is Yang. He's also an adjunct professor here. And uh, he was another one of my students. And during the construction of the tallest building at the time, which was in Taipei, Taipei 101, I was allowed to visit the building while it was being constructed. Okay? So you could see the structure of the steel and so on. Now, what is the biggest uh, issue for human beings when you make a very tall building? Yeah. You know, if I take a short rod of steel, it's quite stiff, isn't it? What if I make a longer rod? It's quite flexible, right? So when you make a really tall building, what do you expect? At the very top, there's a lot of swinging, almost uh, two meters. Now, human beings are not comfortable when the building is swishing about two meters, right? So how do you stop that? How do you stop really tall buildings from doing that? Well, Go on. Make it stiffer. Um, but I think, yeah, yeah, you're right. So this is a 90-ton steel ball which hangs from the top and uh, pushes some uh, devices into silicon oil to damp the vibrations, all right? And this heavy ball is held by these ropes. Now. What are the ropes made out of? It's obviously steel, but the strongest ropes are made from perlite, right? So you make perlite and then you draw it out, and that gives you typically strength of the order of two to three gigapascals drawn per. So almost all the wire ropes that you see, like this, 
are made from perlite. So perlite is extremely important in the coal deformed state. It's very, very strong. So these are typical perlite ropes, okay? You can get in many dimensions and so forth. And this is another object that I visited. It's the longest single span bridge in the world. So it goes across two kilometers with the supports being two kilometers apart. And it's in an earthquake zone, just like Taipei 101 is in an earthquake zone. This is in a severe earthquake zone, Japan. And these are cables holding that suspension bridge. And the strength of those cables, you know, the cables are that, bigger than this wide. I've got another picture showing that, okay? So obviously there are many, many cables inside that. Uh, and the atmosphere inside, inside the cable is maintained uh, as inert so that you don't get corrosion. And it's able to span two kilometers without any support underneath. Okay, because the ropes are extremely strong, something of the order of three gigapascals in strength. Okay, so I've emphasized to you that perlite is extremely important. And when you go around the world, you know, as a tourist, what you should really be looking at is the steel and how impressive it is in creating these structures. Okay? And then come back and report on whether it's perlite or ferrite or whatever. So obviously, Reactions begin by nucleation, right? Nucleation from austenite. But here we have two phases. We have cementite and ferrite. So there was quite a lot of research done to discover whether nucleation of perlite begins with ferrite or begins with cementite. And then later on, uh, they grow together because supposing cementite nucleates first, then it removes carbon. That favors the formation of ferrite and therefore they can grow cooperatively. So, in summary, basically when you have a hypo-eutectoid steel, that means carbon concentration is less than about 0.8 weight percent, you will nucleate ferrite first, and when you have a hyper-eutectoid steel, you will nucleate cementite first. This is a, a high magnification image of the beginnings of a perlite colony. So you can see inside the colony, uh, the transformation front hasn't quite established itself completely. Yeah. Okay, so we now consider growth and we simplify the picture uh, and look at it as if these are alternating layers of ferrite and cementite because we are not interested in crystallography here. So this is the thickness of the layer of ferrite and the thickness of the layer of cementite. So what do you think determines the relative thicknesses of cementite and ferrite? Sorry? Um, but they can grow and become fatter or thinner, right? Hmm? Yeah, the chemical composition. So if you have a lot of carbon in the perlite, uh, perlite does not form with a constant composition. You can form perlite even in a fully perlitic structure, even in a 0 0.4 carbon steel. So let me just skip this. If you look at this, if I extrapolate the gamma plus cementite phase field and extrapolate the gamma plus ferrite phase field, if you supercool the austenite within this region, you will get a fully perlitic microstructure, even though it's not 0 0.8 weight percent. So this region is called the Hultgren extrapolation. If I take my austenite and quickly cool it to this temperature, even though it's not 0.8 carbon roughly, we will get a fully perlitic structure. Okay? So the volume fraction of cementite in that fully perlitic structure depends on the average composition of your steel. So the sum of the thickness of the ferrite and the thickness of the cementite is what we call the interlamella spacing, which we will call S, right? And obviously ferrite doesn't want carbon and cementite wants carbon. And this is the common transformation front with the austenite. So as this grows, carbon is pushed ahead of the ferrite and as the cementite grows, it absorbs carbon. Okay? 
So actually the diffusion this time is not occurring in the direction of growth. It's happening from here to here. Okay. Uh, this is the diffusion part. It's parallel to the transformation front. And the diffusion distance is determined by the interlamellar spacing. Right? So that diffusion distance is a constant. Everyone happy with that? So it's totally different from the single phase growth that we considered earlier, where you build up carbon ahead of the interface. Here, the carbon that is partitioned into the austenite by the ferrite is absorbed by the cementite. And this is the meaning of cooperative growth. The composition of the austenite away from the interface does not change, right? At least for a binary alloy, it does not change, okay? Okay, so the compositions at the interface will be given by the phase diagram depending on what temperature you are transforming at. So, for example, if we are transforming at this temperature, the composition in the austenite, which is what we are interested in because it's the diffusion is happening in the austenite ahead of the interface. Composition in the austenite, which is in equilibrium cementite, is given by C gamma theta and the composition in the austenite ahead of the ferrite is given by C gamma alpha. And this is greater than this, so there's a flux of carbon from the austenite adjacent to the ferrite to the cementite adjacent to the ferrite. Okay. So what's driving it is that difference in concentration. Everyone happy with that? And then of course we have our average composition somewhere between those two points. So to grow perlite, you need both cementite and ferrite growth to be possible. You cannot grow perlite at this temperature or this temperature because here you cannot form ferrite, here you cannot form cementite. Okay, okay so very easy now. This is our picture. This is the interlamellar spacing. And since both phases are growing at the same time and at the same rate, we can treat the growth process in terms of just one phase. They're growing uh, cooperatively. So I'm going to look at cementite growth. This is the composition of cementite, which has 6.67 weight percent of carbon. This is the composition of the austenite that is in equilibrium with cementite over here. And this is the composition of the austenite, which is in equilibrium with ferrite. And we saw in the previous phase diagram that C gamma alpha is greater than C gamma theta. So there's a gradient uh, here which is driving this flux here. Okay, so just to go back, you can see that the composition of the austenite in equilibrium with ferrite is greater than the composition of the austenite in equilibrium with cementite. Okay, everyone happy with this picture of the... Um, profile here. This is cementite and it's drawing the carbon that is rejected by the ferrite into the austenite. Okay. So we use our standard theory that the rate at which solute is absorbed by the cementite must be equal to the rate at which it's arriving by diffusion. Okay, the diffusion flux. And the rate at which the cementite is absorbing the carbon, if I allow the interface to move a little bit here, then that's the amount of carbon that the cementite has absorbed, right? Previously, you know, the carbon here was this much. If the cementite has grown to this position, then it's absorbed that much carbon, which is C theta minus C gamma theta. And when we multiply it by the velocity, that's the rate at which the cementite is absorbing the carbon. Yeah? Now it's arriving at this interface by diffusion, and diffusion is driven by this gradient here. So the diffusion flux is C gamma alpha minus C gamma theta and divided by the diffusion distance here, which is something along here. Okay? Now this term A, uh, We'll assume it to be one, but it's not strictly correct that you know the diffusion distance is the interlamellar spacing because the carbon here has to diffuse this distance, right? 
the carbon here has to diffuse a shorter distance and so on. But I don't want you to worry about that. Just take A to be 1 for the purposes of this lecture. Okay? Everyone happy with this? And you can see clearly that S, the diffusion distance, is constant. So there is nothing to solve here. The velocity is equal to this term divided by this term. Right? Very simple growth rate calculation. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you can say it's half, okay, because that is the diffusion distance. Yeah? Because stuff over here moves here and stuff over here moves here. But it could be less than half because this is the extreme distance from here. It could be, you know, this takes a shorter distance here. But don't worry about that. Okay, so you see, there's, there's very easy theory for the growth rate of perlite. But of course, we don't know what the interlamellar spacing is, right? And are we taking account of everything? Is there something missing in this theory? Uh, so we are approximating it by a diffusion flux, yeah? Fixes law. But in addition to growing the phases, what are we doing? What else are we creating? So we are creating volume fractions of ferrite and cementite, but what else are we creating? Here? Yeah? You are on, I think you are right, but you have to speak louder, yeah? Interfaces, yeah, exactly. So these boundaries have energy. And, you know, if you make, if you make your spacing finer, the perlite can grow faster according to this equation. If I make the spacing zero, it will grow at an infinite rate. That's because we are ignoring the creation of interfaces, right? So we've got to allow for that. Okay, so let's imagine this is our perlite colony and uh, we're looking at unit dimensions, right? So the volume of this object is 1 and this is a, a lamella which is inside the colony and this is a lamella which is sharing with another colony. So there's one interface here two interfaces here and two, one interface here, right? So there are four interfaces of area one by one, okay? So if I want to work out the amount of surface per unit volume, then I just take that area and I divide it by the volume, right? And we get the amount of surface per unit volume is equal to 2 divided by the interlamellar spacing, which is half. Yeah? So we had 4 meters squared divided by 1 cubic meter. And if the interlamellar spacing is half a meter, then the amount of surface per unit volume is 2 divided by S. Okay? So finally we make S the more interface you have per unit volume and the more cost you have, right? So if I want to work out the energy due to those interfaces, what do I do? This is just the amount of interface per unit volume to work out the energy, multiply by the interfacial energy per unit area, okay? So, this is the amount of surface per unit volume and the amount of energy that's stored as cementite ferrite interface is simply SV times sigma, right? where sigma is the interfacial energy per unit area. So, this is an additional cost that we have to pay.
And since SV is equal to 2 divided by the interlamellar spacing, we have a relationship between interlamellar spacing and the stored energy of a perlite colony. Everyone happy with that? Okay. So, supposing that all of the free energy change, because of cooled arsenide, is used up in creating interfaces, then SC is the critical spacing, the smallest spacing that can be tolerated for a given free energy because all of the free energy change is consumed in creating interfaces. Okay? So delta G minus system would be zero. Okay? So this is the case where all of the free energy is consumed in creating interfaces. So SC is the critical minimum spacing at which you get zero growth. Okay? Okay, so this is just rearranging this equation so that you have the critical spacing given by 2 sigma divided by the available free energy change. Okay? Right, so we have the free energy change equal to the energy locked up as interfaces when the spacing is equal to the critical spacing SC. Okay. So at any other spacing, the net free energy available is the chemical free energy change, assuming there are no interfaces, reduced by a quantity which is locked up in the form of interfaces, right? Now I can replace delta G here by 2 sigma over SC, which is done over here. So 2 sigma over SC gives me delta G. And <coughs> I'm just going to rearrange this to take the sigma, 2 sigma out common here. So the available free energy is 2 sigma, 1 upon SC minus 1 upon S, and clearly when SC is equal to S, there is no free energy available for growth. Okay? Now if I take SC out common, then I have a term which is 1 minus SC over S. When SC is equal to S, again the growth rate is 0, because there is no free energy available. Okay? So all we have to do, you know, given that velocity is approximately proportional to driving force, we simply scale the velocity by this factor here. Okay. So this was our original equation and all we do is we multiply it by this factor to take account of the energy stored as interfaces. Yep. Now, this is an interesting uh, equation. It's, it's similar to what we did with weidmann staten ferrite growth where, you know, you couldn't determine the tip radius just from the diffusion theory. You, you could get a function of velocity as a function of uh, tip radius, but not an actual velocity, right? So similarly here, we can get the velocity as a function of the interlamellar spacing, but not the actual velocity. So if I plot this function, uh, which is velocity versus interlamellar spacing, I get a curve which looks like this, where I'm plotting the growth rate versus the interlamellar spacing. And again, I can't actually the velocity of growth. So what can I do? Yeah, I told you this is a classical problem for dendritic growth and many other situations like this. For weidmann staten ferrite growth, is there anything that helps us to choose an interlamellar spacing? I think you know the answer because you gave me the answer for weidmann staten ferrite 
how would I choose the correct interlamellar spacing? You definitely know the answer, yeah? Yeah, what, what, what is it? Ma maximum, right? So we could assume that the perlite will choose a spacing that allows it to grow at the fastest rate. We have absolutely no justification for that because it could be, for example, the maximum entropy production rate and so on, uh, or the stability of the interface, you know, at what velocity is the interface most stable, and so on. So, the simplest thing to do is to pick the maximum velocity, and then to check experimentally whether that is reasonable. There's no basic theory that we can use to assess the spacing that should be operating during perlite growth. And it's not a bad approximation, if I go back to this equation and I differentiate it with respect to S, then I want you to prove for yourself that the maximum velocity happens when the spacing is twice the critical spacing. So critical spacing is this one, okay, where the growth rate becomes zero. And when the spacing is twice the critical spacing, you get the fastest growth. Because, you know, in this region, you're consuming too much free energy as interfaces. And in this region, the diffusion distance is becoming longer. Therefore, you know, you slow the process down. Okay? And actually, if you get too large a spacing, then the perlite will subdivide and reduce the spacing. So you get branching of the cementite lamella happening. Okay, so that basically covers uh, the theory for perlite. And I've assumed here that we have a binary alloy, iron and carbon. And when that is the case, you know, there's no uh, change in the composition of the austenite. But if I go back to my first slide, or second slide, This actually is a slide uh, from Hadfield manganese steel, right? So Hadfield manganese steel has about 13 weight percent of manganese, one weight percent of carbon, and it's austenitic. You hold it at certain temperatures, and you get perlite forming. Okay. Now, when you have that, the eutectoid on the phase diagram is not a single temperature you can have a three-phase region over a range of temperatures where austenite, cementite, and ferro equilibrium. So it doesn't matter how long I hold that temperature, I will not get more perlite than the equilibrium quantity, right? Because ferrite, cementite, and austenite can exist in equilibrium. And that means that the manganese concentration of the austenite is actually changing with time. And when it reaches the equilibrium concentration, the perlite reaction stops. So for ternary alloys or higher order alloys, it is possible that you do not get 100% perlite, right? If you hold it in the three-phase field, which is below the, phase, uh, below the eutectoid temperature. Okay. So when that happens, the driving force decreases as the perlite grows. So what do you expect to see in the microstructure of the perlite if the driving force decreases. Sorry? Yeah, certainly the parent phase will remain there, but in the microstructure of the perlite colony, do you expect any change if the driving force decreases as it grows? Very good. So the lamella spacing will have to increase if the driving force decreases, right? So you start with a fine spacing and then it becomes larger and larger. And that's called divergent perlite. So you actually see the lamella spacing increasing as the colony grows, okay? Because the driving force is not constant.
Right, so we've dealt with all of the transformations. Uh, this is a typical time temperature transformation diagram, and we've dealt with growth theory, basically. Uh, what I'd like to do is to actually be able to predict these diagrams. Okay, so you're given a chemical composition. You, how can you work out the kinetics of transformations in a very easy way? So I want you to imagine that we have an austenite grain. And when you hold it at a particular temperature, you start to nucleate particles. Okay, so if it's perlite or ferrite or Wiedemannstein ferrite. How can you calculate the volume fraction given that you, know, you will have to have a nucleation rate, a growth rate, and the fact that when a particle touches another particle, it can't grow. How do we handle that in an equation? Okay? So we'll do this in the next lecture uh, using something called Avrami theory, where we look at um, a very simple way of taking account of impingement. That means when particles hit each other. And then you can happily calculate time temperature transformation diagrams if you have the basic theory for growth and the basic theory for nucleation. Okay? So we'll do that in the next lecture.